Welcome back to the Health Physics Society's video series, Pursuing the Truth and Promoting Transparency regarding the historical foundations of the current radiation protection philosophy based on a linear no threshold for cancer risk assessment. I'm Dr. John Cartarelli, President of the Health Physics Society. In the second episode, we learned about some early influential minds and their research to understand the theory of evolution. In the third episode, the viewer will hear about Herman Muller's scientific revolution in gene mutation theory when he proposed that there was no safe level of exposure to ionizing radiation. And we'll look at the radiation dose rates from which he extrapolated the data and came to this conclusion. I want to go into uh, where this LNT really starts, the conceptual aspect of it. Uh, as I mentioned before, it really, it really starts with, with how um, Gilbert Lewis's paper in Nature uh, took the Muller findings. Because he took the Muller findings and he, he quickly ran with it to, to use LNT to, to account for evolution. And so this was initially, um, initially uh, looked at with, with some great interest and support, even support with some of Muller's students and some of their mutational data. However, in 1930, Muller published a paper with a physicist from Rice University, and they looked at Muller's data and they tried to interpret it in light of this, this uh, Gilbert Lewis LNT theory for evolution. And the, the really interesting thing was that Muller at that point was using his LNT model. And so Muller looked at his control group mutation rate and using the LNT model and understanding what background radiation was, what Muller uh, came to learn was astounding. And that was that the background radiation, even assuming a linear dose response, could only account for one thirteen hundredth of the mutation rate in the control group. And so this was background radiation that somebody living on Earth would experience. And if you assume that there was radiation was a cause and you took Muller's data from his exposed groups and you just did a linear extrapolation back to background, then all that it could explain was a tiny, 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 minuscule fraction of the mutation that was going on in his control group. And so Muller looked at that and, and said, well, the one thing I know for sure, and that is that, that life on Earth and how it evolved is not going to be explained by background radiation, cosmic radiation. There has to be something else explaining it. This becomes a big deal later on in our discussion because if background radiation is not the cause of, is not the cause of evolution, and if you still believe that in evolution, and if you uh, believe that it's due to some manipulation and changes in, in the genes, then, then what's actually causing that? Because if it's not background radiation, then, um, well, what is it? So the radiation accounted for less than, well under 1% of the, of the mutations in the group that was not irradiated. That's right. That's right. So 99, over 99% of those mutations had to be occurring due to something else. Exactly, exactly. And so this was a, this is a, actually a very big observation. And so, and so you might have thought that, well, um, what does this lead Muller next to? And so, well, what happened with, with Muller is that he, you know, he didn't abandon the LNT concept. What he did was, uh, in, his, in his research, um, he did uh, three experiments. And his experiments were, that led to his, uh, what will be called his Nobel Prize that he gets a number of years later. But in his experiments, he did not do, um, and wasn't designed to do a dose-response relationship. It was, um, he had, he had, um, he had uh, three experiments. The first one had four doses. And, and I'd have to say, if you really look at his, the, the results, it showed a threshold. Uh, it really did show a threshold. But he abandoned that model for a more sensitive model. And he used only two doses in his subsequent um, two experiments. He couldn't get really at a dose response with only two doses. And so he just blew off the first study, focused on the other two, because those were the more sensitive, the more sensitive model at that, at that time. And so what he did after, after his, his grand uh, set of experiments, um, and he came back from um, sharing that with, with the world, 
what he did was he got a couple of students um, to go into his lab and to actually do a dose response study. And so what he uh, got them to do was to uh, look at uh, four doses. So it could at least make, um, see if there's a straight line there or, or what the, the shape of the dose response would be. Now, I mentioned that Muller used um, very high doses. And so his, the lowest of his two doses was 100 million times background. Well, the, the lowest dose that his students used were pretty high still. They're around 25 to 30 million fold above background. Very, very high. And then his, the subsequent doses went higher. And when you say above background, are we talking about the dose rate that they were being exposed to or a total dose in a given amount of time? Just so the audience understands. It's a dose rate. A dose rate. Thank and so, you. And so what happens in, in this particular case is that the two student papers, they both showed a linear dose response. And so this got Muller very excited. And what happened, and that was uh, around 1929 or so. And so what happened is that uh, they published their papers. They were dissertations. I got copies of the dissertations and the like. Went to them in some considerable detail. And so what happened um, beyond them publishing a paper and so forth was that Muller used these two studies to consolidate his belief in the nature of the dose response in the low dose zone. And, and he decided in his own mind, his own belief, that the nature of the dose response was actually a linear uh, dose response all the way down to a single ionization so that there was no deviation from this. And this is where, in his mind, the LNT comes from. Now, yes, one can give uh, credit to Gilbert Lewis for our first mentioning it in 1928 in that Nature paper trying to explain evolution. But he was, he was using um, Muller's data and, and another colleague's data in another university, uh, but they really didn't have good dose-response relationships. Um, these two had at least four doses. Muller. Um, extrapolates from 25 to 30 million fold above background down to background and below background. He assumes that there is, that there is no safe level. And, and so what Muller does in 1930 is that he creates the beginnings, you might say the, the, uh, the embryonic concept of the uh, LNT. doesn't call it LNT, he calls it the proportionality rule. And proportionality, that's really the same thing as an LNT. It's just that the response is directly proportional to dose. And a few years later, it'll be changed and called a linear dose response. But, but in the literature of the day, when, when Muller articulated it in writing, he called it the proportionality dose response. And then he, he ultimately, and very soon later in that paper, he calls it the proportionality rule. And I would have to admit that I was in the field for many, many years. Uh, and it wasn't until probably in the early um, decade of uh, the, the, the current, uh, you know, millennium that we're into that I understood um, this idea of when I started to do a deep dive on Muller and, and the history of dose response, I, I had never heard the term proportionality rule. I had been in the field for, for, you know, 35 to 40 years teaching LNT, LNT, and I never knew that in fact it started not with the term LNT, but with the term and the concept proportionality rule. And so Muller um, focused on this, and, and that was the conceptualizing uh, framework of this. And, 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 and then it, it, it goes forward from there, but it's, it's that thought, and it was, it, it was a thought that originated within the, um, within the framework of radiation um, geneticists. This is, that, that, this is a very significant issue because it wasn't that, you know, Muller uh, comes up with a linear dose response. The, the dose response at the time that Muller was formulating these things, um, that wasn't the dominant uh, dose response. Um, the dominant dose response was the threshold dose response. And the threshold dose response is one that, that uh, as, as the term kind of implies, you have to cross a certain line or barrier or threshold. And when you cross that line, then something happens. And so it's kind of like uh, drinking alcohol, something like this, that if you, if you drink too much or too quickly, you may begin to feel lightheaded. 
so you cross a threshold. But if you if you sipped wine um, very slowly, then you may never feel. Uh, it's kind of like a dose rate situation. You may not feel that 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 change. You don't cross that threshold. And in and in general, uh, that was the belief when it came to toxic substances, and it came even to radiation, that there was a level that was safe. And that there was a, and, and that was safe was below a threshold. When you cross the threshold, you cross the line, then something happened. Now, crossing the line could mean uh, a good effect, uh, a beneficial effect from a drug, or it could be a bad effect from something that was toxic. But, but there were thresholds, and, and this was the general belief. And so, Muller, when he came out and he said, radiation's different, radiation doesn't follow this, this threshold concept. Radiation has a new way of relating to biology, and it relates to it in a, in a linear fashion, and there's no safe level of exposure, and you can't escape from it. And, and this became a, actually a, a major break in the field, and, and, and it evolved within the framework of, of his own discipline. And his discipline was you know, the radiation geneticist. And this was solely based on the fruit fly data. Uh, yeah. not, not on data that uh, uh, about with including exposures to mammals or humans or yeah, exactly and I'd I have to say I'm, I'm not sure about you and you know how quickly you come to believe something how quickly you fall in love you know that sort of thing right um, the uh, the issue of, of Muller is um, you know Muller had two students who they did a study each they they did a study that was uh, I'll call them good studies for the time period. Uh, he guided them on them. They showed, as far as I'm concerned, um, they showed a linear dose-response relationship. Um, I wouldn't dispute that at all. It's what exactly the data said. Now, but what Muller did was that Muller said, now I'd say, well, the data actually showed there's a linear dose-response within the range that was tested. But what Muller then did was he decided to, what, that famous word, uh, extrapolate. And so he went outside the observed data, but he didn't just go kind of outside the, the observed by a little bit. He, he actually went from about 30 million times above background down to background and below. It's kind of like saying, well, I know what the weather is today and maybe for the next couple of days, I'm going to extrapolate on what the, the weather forecast will be three years from now. And, and in effect, that's what Mala was doing. He was going way beyond his data and extrapolating into, into a vast unknown zone. Now, I've thought about this a lot um, because I, I tend to be one who, I'm very slow to believe anything. And, and I, I, I need more, I need more. I mean, and, and, and it's, maybe that's it's a, just a personality quirk, but it's who I am. And I'm trying to say um, what I have believed um, when there was a, an exposure that was 30, the lowest dose, 30 million times above background, what I have come to a, almost like a religious uh, conversion belief, uh, that, that in fact, that would, that would guide my, my thinking and my principles and my, all these applications um, based upon two extremely, extremely high dose studies to then come out with policies that would relate back to background radiation. I said, I said, was that, it gave me an insight into Mala's intuition. You know, and that's, that's kind of an intuitive situation. I, you know, it's like a person who meets someone for the first time and falls in love and that's it. And, and you, it's like you, your, your intuition takes over. Were other researchers doing research in this area? Other radiation experiments trying to induce these mutations or? Was, was Muller really the leader in that area? Well, I can tell you that Muller created a revolution. Okay, he wasn't the only one, okay? And there were others that were contemporary. At that point in time, uh, there were researchers who were all going for the glory of the Nobel Prize. And they wanted to be the first to, to induce gene mutation. Now, I would say a number of people had induced uh, cross uh, transgenerational uh, phenotypic changes so that you could see a, a you, you treat with a high dose of radiation and you look into the next generation and you could see changes in the visual appearance of the of corn or an insect, something of those 
something along those lines. But those, those researchers, their, their research was never given great standing because they used such high doses that it was assumed that how it came to be was through pretty gro grotesque chromosomal changes. They caused um, rearrangements in chromosomes, big gaps in the chromosomes, deletions, uh, inversions, all kinds of, just because it was like, you know, like hitting the, 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 uh, the chromosome with like a baseball bat. And, and, so, and so they didn't think that could be possibly how evolution took place. They thought that evolution had to take place much more subtly and, and, and with much less um, you know, rigor in terms of you know, bashing of, of the biological material. And so all the people coming up until the time of Muller, uh, they were somewhat dismissed as, yeah, they had produced uh, mutations, mutations in the current generation and the next generation, and, but they were not given the... Uh, the, the recognition that they had at all approached this issue of, uh, of, of evolution. And so, but because people knew that there was an answer there, there were four or five groups that were like Muller, they were going for it. And, 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 and there was, for example, um, a person whose name I'll mention a little bit later, but his name is Louis Statler, Louis J. Statler. He was a, a, um, a corn geneticist at the University of Missouri. And and in the race, Muller doesn't know how close he is to winning or losing. Statler is less than three months behind him. It's, it's very close. In academic terms and research, three months is like, you know, it's like a, it's like a, a moment in time. It's fast. And, but I, I also want to point out something, and this, is, this is, uh, illustrates a behavioral um, character trait in Muller, and one that will be shown up later and later, and that was that Muller would publish his paper um, in um, July, July 22nd of 1927, in the biggest journal in the world, Science. And that's where he, he publishes his paper. And the title of his paper is called the, um, um, the Artificial Transmutation of the Gene. Okay, the Artificial Transmutation of the Gene. And, and the Muller had, to, he was trying to, to make sure that people knew that he wasn't just playing with chromosomes and bashing things and getting his mutations and getting the, the phenotypic change in the next generation. He was doing it by changing the gene. That made him special. And so, and it was very, very curious how he, how he used that uh, in the title because it was really distinguishing himself from the crowd. Thank you for watching the third episode on the historical foundations of the linear no threshold theory where we learned about Muller's fruit fly experiments and his extrapolation of data to make conclusions. The next episode discusses Muller's ability to publish data and conclusions without the peer review process. The HPS is a trusted source of radiation information. We're a scientific organization and as is offered with the scientific peer review process, Viewers are encouraged to send comments or suggested corrections to factcheck at hps.org and be sure to include your sources so that we may correct the record if necessary. If any changes are made, they will appear at the end of this episode. Please visit our Ask the Expert website at the link below to ask questions or seek answers to common radiation-related questions and view our fact sheets. We also have official position statements that can be found on our website at hps.org. Finally, if you wish to join the Home for Radiation Protection Professionals, please visit the link below. We welcome you.